ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina muhammad wa man wa la rabbi syarah li sadri wa sirri nisani of kawkawli brothers and sisters I'm very happy to be here with you on this um, blessed day of Ramadan in this very beautiful uh, space but I'm not happy about what I'm about to discuss is love enough asking you, is love enough? Say yes or no. Those who say love is enough, put your hands up, please. See, uh, a lot of you agree with me, it's not enough. Is credit card enough? Put your hands up. The issue about relationship, Muhammad, is very important in Islam. But the most important kind of relationship is one that takes place within marriage. I do not have to emphasize the significance of marriage in our religion. Over one third of our sharia, of our fiqh, is based on the protection of the family institution, and that means uh, marriage. So it is critical that as we go through a, a period in which this very significant institution seems to be literally not missing words, collapsing and having less and less significance in our lives. And it is a story, alhamdulillah, not all, but mostly of failure, that we pause and we ask the question, what is going on, what is happening, and what can we do about it? I'm afraid there are no magical uh, portions or solutions. But the most important thing in all this is one is discussion and communication. This is why such a gathering like today is too big for one individual, one sheikh, one scholar, one country, one nation. It is a global thing. I'm actually here to be a sideshow. The main attraction for this morning is uh, this uh, woman on my right, who has very experience in uh, marriage issues, besides other issues that are to relate with community and community building. She's particularly lucky, of course, that she's married to me. I think happily for 27 years. Everybody always, she makes jokes that when we go to places, some people sometimes mistake me that I'm our father and she's my daughter. But this is partly because she sucks all the happiness and I end up with all the sadness. So I end up doing the difficult things and she does the easy thing. Mullah Masruddin, who is very famous in the Muslim folklore, once went to give Juma khutbah. And he gave a very, very stimulating and inspiring talk on the necessity for people to share. His wife was leaving the house not far from the mosque, was hearing the khutbah. The mom said it's very important Muslims share what they have with those who don't have. The 
I remember was making biryani, which was a favorite of the Mullah Nasruddin. But he was so moved by it that she took it out and gave it to a group of poor people outside the house. When the Mullah came home, very hungry and sweaty, he asked her if where's the food? She said, my husband, today your talk was really good. So good I could not resist your advice. And I shared the food with the poor people. Mullah Nasruddin turned red and got very angry. He told her, you stupid woman, that message was not for you, it was for the others. So here as we go, the discussion is, the messages we give is for everybody, not for a select few. When we talk about the issues, it's for each and every one of us. Without much ado, I'll ask uh, Umera Khan to open the discussion with her presentation. And then we'll come back to me, and then we'll continue with the question and answer. Again, thank you very much for your attendance and patience, and may Allah bless us with insight and uh, humility to learn and to share for this morning, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. And it's, as Fahad said, it's a great pleasure to be here. And on a Saturday at 11 o'clock during Ramadan, uh, I really uh, appreciate all of you coming here and looking very alert, alhamdulillah. I would just say, because I'm doing a PowerPoint, if you can't see, because of the the columns, you might want to move into a position that you can see. And also I have a habit of talking a bit fast sometimes. So if I'm talking too fast, just put your hands up and I'll, I'll try and slow down. <laughs> Already? <laughs> um, well, what I can say is that uh, first I'd like to thank Sister Shahira who asked me to speak today and uh, we've been having some conversations about this subject and uh, we were saying, you know, why do this in Ramadan? Right? Why this subject? Because people say maybe it's not a subject for Ramadan. But then on reflection we thought, no, it, it is a subject for Ramadan because Ramadan is a month of renewal and reflection and the engagement with the Quran and uh, we hope that through that engagement we look back into ourselves as a mirror, the Quran as a mirror and we can maybe do something a little bit better in our lives inshallah. So um, as far said in his intro introduction to me, I can definitely say being married for 27 years is what you, no book, no course, no PhD can teach you anything about marriage other than being in it itself. And I think when I, before I got married on Mahana night, one of a close friend who was older than me, she whispered to me, uh, now that you're getting married, you understand the other side of you, the other half of you. I didn't really get what she meant at the time. All right, exactly. I know people say, you know, we're like twin and halves and things, but the way she said it, she said you've discovered things about yourself that you didn't know. Uh, and of course, over the years, I've come to understand what she means by that. Uh, and I think what marriage does at a level that we often don't recognize or understand, it either brings out our strengths or reminds us sometimes of what we don't have. And we also see in the other person their strengths and weaknesses. And we have to find a way to negotiate that. And then negotiating that over the years is not a straight line, or it doesn't go like this. It goes like this. It's a wave. You have good points and you have the hard times and good points and hard times. And that really, for me, is what marriage is about. It's not this trajectory that goes up in one direction. Um, and we have a tendency in Muslims just to say, throw away comments. Yes, marriage is half your deen. It completes half your deen. Uh, but as Fahd likes to often quote, 
but it makes a mess of the other half, right? So it completes half our being, yes, but it challenges us in the other half. And if we don't go into marriage with that awareness, then we're not really going into marriage with the right sort of perspective. But what I want to do today is, is share with you just some thoughts and ideas and concepts. First of all, I should say that I'm, I'm not a theologian, I'm not an academic, I'm basically an activist. And over the years, the 30 years I've been involved with Amnesty Society, dealing with the complexities of the problems in the Muslim community, we have had to try to learn to say, okay, as Muslims, we like to say Islam has all the answers, but why is it that we're struggling when there seems to be no answers? So therefore, the motivation for us was to say, how do we find the answers to these issues in our community and be honest about it? So what I want to do is I just want to share some of the things over the years that I, I've understood. I want to start a little bit by looking at our traditional paradigm, how we understand marriage in our cultural understanding of it. Uh, I think the PowerPoint is a little bit stretched, so please ignore that. Traditionally, when we think of marriage culturally, in our minds we had this idea or this experience that marriage and family life is the center of our community social experience, right? My parent generation and our grandparents' generation, getting married and family life and the relationship within the marriage was the, really the center of our lives. The communities that we lived in, uh, the way we engaged, our social lives geared around that, right? And children and you know the, the, the cycle of life in that sense. And this section in the middle, which intersects our family and marriage, is where we had less time really, I suppose, or less involvement in how we were as individual. Being individual in our traditional paradigm became secondary to our collective way we saw ourselves. We saw each other either as a married couple or part of a family. So being an individual was less important. I mean, I grew up in a very extended patriarchal family where the man is the head of the family and makes all the decisions once upon a time, that has changed now a little bit. But, so that's how we understood it. And our relationship to the wider world, humanity as a whole, was also secondary. We were much more zoomed in into our local communities. And there were factors that affected us, how we lived our lives. Uh, and if you go to places, old cities like Fez and other places like that, you find that family, community life, economic life were intertwined with each other. The, where the men went off to work wasn't a two mile drive down the road. Uh, you know, they didn't come home at midnight. Or, but they lived down the road. The, 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 those of you who've been to Fez will know that the markets and the tradesmen and the craftsmen and the artisans, they all live nearby. And women also were engaged, not just in family life, but in creativity and product, producing things like berries and rugs and pots and painting. And so both men and women were working together in an environment where they went far away from each other, right? So therefore, our social and economic lives were very closely linked together. And when you talk to people of a, like my parents' generation and before, pretty much that's what they remember, even though it might have looked a bit different in different cultures. And I've asked people here even, before modernity, before the sort of way we live now, people still have little memories and maybe you find it in the villages when you go home, somewhere outside. You'll see a much more slow rhythm of life, much more connected. Children are running around the street without any care, right? So for those of us who are urban people, which increasingly the vast majority of us are, this has changed. This is, this is a memory we have, but does it really exist any longer? We have to ask ourselves that question. 
And when we think of marriage, we think happy ever after. We don't really think about it. We just think, you see a girl of marriageable age and a boy of marriageable age, yeah, marriage, and it's all romantic, a bit of like Aladdin and yes, me, yes, they go up in the marriage carpet. And that's very simplistically how we think of marriage, actually. And we don't think about it more than that. So I want to argue really that this paradigm, we, it's lost. We don't really have this paradigm any longer, right? And I want to talk about some of the problems. Um, I haven't got any recent stats, but this is only from the last few years. Uh, a country like Saudi Arabia, which is supposed to be a very traditional society, uh, has one of the highest divorce rates. Uh, the court registers 40 marriages and 20 divorces a day, which is quite shocking. And in a study done uh, in that country, the main reasons for divorce, ill treatment and violence, divorce happening in the first three years of marriage, which is a very interesting phenomenon. Why is, why is that happening? Right? Loss of trust, sincerity, compassion, cooperation. Husbands in particular, although you can say both husbands and wives, uh, in illicit relationships, incompatibility and misunderstanding. So why, when we see such stats, we've got to ask ourselves, why is this happening? I don't know what your stats are here, but I hear anecdotally that you also have possibly similar stats. In a survey done in America by Sound Vision, you may know that organization, it says if you attended six Muslim weddings this summer, chances are that two will end up in divorce. Okay? And what they found, again, very similar to Saudi Arabia, the reasons for the divorce, in-laws, adultery, emotional dysfunction, incompatibility, fairy tale expectations, uh, what they identified as secular individualism, and I'll go into that in a little bit more. And what they mean by Burger King syndrome is that uh, as an individual, you have, it's, it's the way you want it, it's your way. Lack of compromise, right? Fast, fast food, like fast relationships. Abuse, lack of preparation, money, lying and hiding vital information, all right? So therefore, let's keep these in our minds and think what is behind some of these things. And before I carry on, I just want to have a look at types of marriage, because again, we have a stereotype of what marriages are. And there's not only one kind of marriage. The girl is 18, the boy is 21. That was once upon a time. When I was growing up, that was the average. I think the average now is 25 to 30, that both girls and young men get married. But we have a range of different types of marriages, all with their different challenges. And one cap does not fit all. We can't approach all of these in the same way. We have people who get married very young and people who are getting married later in life. We expect men sometimes to get married over 30, but increasingly women are not married 30 plus. So therefore, that's a different challenge that approaches. We have arranged cultural marriages, arranged religious marriages. Um, we have marriages where uh, you know, nobody's really interested in religion until one day there's a problem and they bring religion into it. I remember speaking to one of the scholars back home in a divorce case where the couple was really wanting the religious rights and to, you know, the, the, the marriage situation was complicated, but when they got married, they weren't interested in religion. So the sheikh said to me, look, Hamara, how can they want to be so particular about divorce when they weren't particular about marriage in the first place? They didn't make religion important, and the reason why they are particular divorce is because of money, right? And that was the reason. Uh, and, and intercultural marriages, marriages with converts, and in Britain we have a big problem with people who are married converts you know, they think, okay, just get married, bismillah, and everything is, shouldn't be a problem. But there are differences of experiences and cultures and things that have to be understood. It's not automatic that people are compatible. Uh, and we have second plus marriages, polygamous marriages, and we have a big problem in Britain at the moment of secret marriages. This is particularly happening amongst young people, actually, quite a lot. 
uh, but also with older people. And then we had people who are married uh, with children uh, and married without children. So the range of sort of experiences that we have. So we have to be aware of all these and not just at one level not discriminate against any of them. And how do people get married? What are the what are the is it? What are the conditions? Uh, often these days, there's a lack of choice of partners, right? Family pressure to get married, and you find that you get either overqualified or underqualified people. Biological factors often is say, okay, yeah, I can't put off marriage any longer. Uh, and social emotional reasons why people get married. People are sometimes very needy. So are we, you know, really getting married when we are in touch with ourselves, in touch with the other person? Are we, are, you know, we have to be aware of the factors. So there's been a paradigm shift. There's been a big paradigm shift. And I'd like to give an example of this paradigm shift through marriage ceremonies, how we get married. Uh, if you look at the red line, this is not scientific, it's just something I put to give an example uh, in a diagram. Often when we get married, the red line represents religion. Actually, religion, Islam, focuses on good character, personality, you know, uh, the goodness of person uh, uh, and compatibility. This is what Islam focuses on. There's actually very little emphasis, it goes zoom right down, on marriage ceremony and all the rituals that we do around marriage ceremony. And then after marriage, Islam focuses on your life afterwards. There's an emphasis on supporting married couples after marriage. Often we don't do that. After the wedding guests have locked on, we forget about them and we don't support them. The blue line represents culture or practice. And often we don't even ask the right questions before marriage. In particular back home, what happens is that girls are being married to men just because the man has actually agreed. People are so desperate because men are a bit reluctant to make proposals these days that when a man shows some interest, people are desperate and they just accept the proposal without even thinking about it, all right? So therefore, we often just go into marriages without thinking of character, compatibility. We don't emphasize that. But as Muslim culturally, we are brilliant at our ceremonies. We have the best and the most extravagant ceremonies, and we focus on that. And then we forget about them afterwards, right? We don't care about them afterwards. So this is just a little, I don't know if some of you can resonate with this in our cultural practices, but this is what I found over the years seems to be happening. So if you see, remember the first uh, model I had of this, we now have moved into a different time. We're living in a more secular world where religion is increasingly being pushed out or our religious values and our religious ethics. And we are now more uh, about being an individual. Everybody's more focused on that. And we're more part of the bigger human community. We are more, it's easier for us to connect via the internet to somebody on the other side of the world and have conversations on, on a whole range of different things about what happening in the world than actually what's happening in our back garden. And the middle section, the crossover, is being shrunk. Our ability to have our family life, our married life, and children, to really engage and be present in those relationships is shrinking. Because we're traveling on hours, we're working hard, we're struggling. Both men and women don't have a choice but to work these days because of financial reasons, whole load, load, load of things. Where we are no longer able to prioritize that. We're also living in different housing structures, different environments. The children can't just play on the street. We just can't go to our next door neighbor and say, I'm leaving the children with you. Or where people used to share food in their neighborhoods and people used to do that. We're less able to do that these days. And we're struggling with these three challenges in our life. The religious, the cultural, and the secular. 
We can't deny any of them. Those are all our realities. We live in that world. But we have to find a way as Muslims to not make these three elements of our lives a burden. We have to find a way to be able to live as Muslims in these three worlds and integrate them without separating them. And one of the things that often puts marriages apart is that people are living separate lives. And they're thinking differently. Their thought patterns, where it comes from, is coming from different places. So we need to find a way to bridge that gap and not to make it a challenge. And so therefore we renegotiate the power paradigm, like I said earlier. We now have a new way that our socioeconomic and family structures, the way that they're being shaped, it's different from a generation or two ago, right? We can't expect to live that kind of life in the life that we live now. We have a completely different environment. So conscientiously we have to try to introduce or maintain in our family life and married life the things that are important for us, uh, the, the principles for us from a religious point of view. And the reality is just a couple of jokes, a couple of women talking in a coffee shop, and, and this is what women say all the time. And I could already see a couple of women laughing because most probably you've said it. I want a man who's loyal, faithful, patient, attentive, forgiving, unselfish, even tempered and a good listener, right? And she said, you want a dog then. <laughs> I mean, what she means, you need a pet, not, not, you don't really want a husband then, right? So that's what women say. Whenever I ask women, okay, what are you looking for? I want somebody who can laugh and I can joke with, who are compatible. I don't know how many women I've heard said that. I said, okay, that's what you want. Let's get real now. It's not always like that. And also, increasingly, the challenges that young girls in particular, see, men have stayed the same, pretty much. Contradict me if you, anything I, you think is not what you think, but in the experience I've seen that men actually haven't shifted too much culturally. Because as a brother said to me some years ago, if I give my wife all of her rights, then I'll be giving up some of mine. He said it as a joke, but men, because men have this thing of, of privilege in society, they don't really need to challenge themselves. And because women have been deprived, perhaps, of some of this, uh, women are looking to Islam in particular to find their value and their purpose and expectations. It's not saying the responsibility belongs to somebody else to make your marriage work. It's not saying that, you know, take the other partner for granted. It's not saying that. You yourself have to know yourself first, and then you can be the right kind of partner for your spouse, basically. So therefore, and of course it means many other things too, but it's one of the things that we need to think about. And what I want to say a little bit about here is that there's something that people know about in these seven-year cycles, right? And, you know, we go through phases over seven years, and sometimes we're very unaware of these. And what uh, often these phases represent is our shift. For example, in the first year, first seven years is where we ground ourselves. When children are small, we give them foundational stuff. In the second year, we begin to approach adolescence and we, we, we embrace our sexual differences, okay? And then after 21 and 28, those two seven year cycles, we're at the age of discovery, where we embrace the world, we go out and we discover. And this is the period we usually find our partners, normally in this period. And then in the fifth uh, seven year cycle, uh, we're more creative uh, and, and we're more creative in that. That's when we're settling down a little bit more. And then it suggests that from 35 to 42 is when we become more philosophical. We ask ourselves deep and meaningful questions. It is possibly the period when people have their midlife crisis, right? Uh, men are famous for having their midlife crisis, and we'll come back to that. But women do, too. And women, women I'm often speaking to of sort of my age, roughly, they're saying, you know, what's the meaning of life? I've had my children, I've done this, I've done that, and I'm suddenly finding that I don't know my husband any longer. We, we didn't invest in the things that we do together. We didn't have conversations with each other. We were too busy with everything else. So in the years between 21 and 28, 
complete those cycles, people were busy with everything else. And maybe we didn't remind ourselves of each other. And I remember being told by one of my teachers, because Father and I have always been busy uh, in our marriage, in our activism and everything. And he said, no, you need to invest now more in your personal lives together because this time will go, particularly in early marriage. And of course, we didn't listen to him too much. And now I look back and I think, yeah, we could have done things differently in those years. We could have spent more time investing in other things. And these things have a habit of coming back and biting you, actually, if you don't make that connection. And I just want to make the connection with seven-year cycles because seven is an important cycle for us as Muslims also. You know, Allah created the world in seven cycles. We go around the Kaaba and seven cycles. I don't know the inner mystical meanings of those things, but they do have, from a religious point of view for us also, some inner spiritual mystical meaning for us, these seven-year cycles. So we need to be aware of ourselves and, and the changes in our relationships and the changes uh, around us during these periods. And going back to the previous of these, we, the less we know ourselves, the less we are able to be aware of these things. So we need to know ourselves more. And I want to just look a little bit about the well-known verses that's often recited in weddings. So a room, I'm not going to read it word for word, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and he's created us, and he's put for us our, our partners, our spouses, the ingredients is love and mercy within tranquility and our differences in our languages. And how does that sort of look? I just want to put it... What, Let's look at that from another point of view. What those verses are saying, that Allah is telling us that he is in the center of all of creation. Everything comes from him. And the second relationship after our relationship with him is the family. And from the family is our spouses and our partners and the love and the mercy he puts between us. This is the core ingredients second to our relationship with Allah. And our differences and our languages and our communication and by communication, I just want to add here, we tend to think like national languages, but our communication between ourselves, between husband and wives, between our body languages, when somebody's angry, you know, somebody's not talking to each other, then we are, this is a language. If we are harsh to each other, if we are not listening to each other, therefore are not hearing when the other person is distressed. And as Sheikh Fahid was saying in the tour that we were here earlier with Radical Middle Way, he uh, um, very much emphasized the importance of um, how the Prophet وسلم, saw all, all the Sahabas were different and how he responded to them with the different languages that he spoke to them in, right? And so being aware of that. And something was really interesting also, he gave this story of Sayyidina Umar, peace be upon him, that one day he was going, he was saying, he went up to Sayyidina Abu Bakr and said, I'm a monophic. And uh, said, Abu Bakr said, what do you mean? He kept saying, I'm a monophic, I'm a monophic. He said, what do you mean by that? He said, look, I, I can't go to the prophet and tell him this, and I'm feeling really bad because when I'm with him, I feel amazing when I'm in the mosque and doing the Bible. I feel really, you know, at the top of wonderful spirituality. But as soon as I leave there, I go to my home, or I go to my work, or go to other places, that declines. I don't feel like that when I'm not there. And uh, so Zainal so Mubarak said, okay, look, there's nothing wrong. Let's go and speak to the Prophet Sallallahu And what his answer was, you know, Ya Umar, you know, that's normal. You know, you're not going to feel the same every step that you take. Everywhere you go, you don't feel the same. So you will have moments when you have that intensity of spirituality, right? But that doesn't, it's not a 24-7 thing. When you go home, the dynamics are different. When you're at work, the dynamics are different. So I thought that was a really beautiful example of showing how the Prophet understood that he didn't ask us to constantly be at this spiritual high. But what we should draw on from that spirituality should 
benefit us in other things. But these are different relationships. But just to say with the cycle is that this is a relationship that we have. And economics here comes last in that cycle. The world that we live in today, we, are, we have actually put economics in the middle of our life. And slowly, slowly, all these other circles have been turned upside down, and the family is actually the victim of our modern lives. So really, we have to find a way to rethink some of these things. And I just want to say a little bit about, which I found this definition of the word love, since we're talking, is love enough? And hub in Arabic is derived from the same root of the word hub, seed. And what it says here, love begins as a tiny speck, a seed that is buried deep in the folds of a receptive heart, carrying the potential of stunning beauty, nourishing sustenance, exotic delicacy, wealth of commodity, shielding shelter, a resurgent growth that is stabilized through deep roots that withstand trauma. So when the Quran talks about love and mercy and love and compassion, this is the dual nature of love. Love is so intense, and it, it, it brings out the, the, our inner humanity. But it needs to be able to also withstand the trauma of love, because love can also create trauma. And so I'm not going to give you the religious argument, because you know it. It's very simple. So the... Um, we know the Quran talks very much about the relationships, about living in love together, and mercy. And uh, the Prophet said, you have not been, see, you've not seen anything like marriage for increasing the love of two people. And if we go back to what I just quoted, that love is a seed. And for every person, that seed might look a little different, but that seed is something that grows. It's not automatic. It's not like watching Love Story on the film or sleepless in Seattle or something like that. So my advice, particularly to young, early, when you're first married, because that period of when you're first married, I'm not going to talk about people who got married for the wrong reasons and where the marriage is a disaster from the beginning. Those marriages exist and that's another conversation. I really want to, I'm focusing on people who got married in principle for all the right reasons and they love each other. There's, there's the potential of love in their relationship. So when you're first married, actually, that is the most receptive time for both of you. And that's the time where particularly women, often make a mistake, because women have a habit, when they love somebody, they go over the top in doing things out of love, right? They'll wash the clothes 10 times, they'll iron 10 times, they'll cook all the favorite dishes, they'll use up all the recipes they know in the first six months of marriage, you know, and they'll do it, you know, they'll put their husband's buttons on his shirt, and as he goes off, packs his lunch, puts a little love note in it maybe. Women go over the top. And my advice to women is, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Slowly, slowly, shway, shway, right? A little bit of love goes a long way. Don't use it all in the first six months and then you're exhausted because if you're going to give, the husband will take. And he'll say, this is nice. I'm enjoying this. And he'll take and take. And, you know, and then suddenly after six months when you don't want to do it any longer, he'll say, what's wrong? Why didn't you do this? And suddenly he'll say, there's something wrong with the marriage because suddenly she's changed. She's now saying to him, well, you go and put your dishes in the sink. You, you are in your shirt. I mean, boards over there. So you've you created the rules, and then you want to break them, right? So my advice to women is, in the first months of marriage, is when you do the things together most. You go shopping together. You do things together. You read together. You you talk together. Invest in the things that you do uh, together. So it becomes a habit, and then. Well, oh, men, what can I say to men? Uh, and I think what women misunderstand about men, they misunderstand the way men express their love. We want men to say, I love you all the time, or show something. And one of the things I realized, not about being saying loving things was probably, but more when I had an argument with Fran, I found it difficult to say sorry, but I would find my favorite drink in the fridge. And I suddenly realized after a period of time, 
suddenly out of the blue coming from heaven, there would be this drink in the fridge. Like, you know, and I realized that is his way of saying sorry. So I had to, <laughs> he doesn't do it anymore. <laughs> I find myself now. So men don't always say things in the way we as men and women want to hear it. We have to learn each other's language. Men have their own expression, the way they say things, the way they think what is important. And sometimes we don't hear it. And we want to hear it the way we like it. And that, if, if we impose on men what we like as women, we're just making the women then. You know, they're men. So we have to draw from men what they are, which is sometimes different. And that works the other way around. And so I was watching an Oprah show some years back, and there was this woman who said, what's the key to marriage? And she said, there are three things that are key that is often lacking, attention, affection, and appreciation. And I thought, yeah, that's good. And most of the people I know, that's what they say. That's sounded right. And I thought, do we have, what does Islam have to say on this subject? And, um, when I thought about it, the Prophet says is the best example. So uh, he said, the good husband is the one when she speaks, he listens. When she complains, he is concerned. All right? So listen. The Prophet said, never let a day pass without showing his affection. So isn't that a good example, brothers? We should follow that example. Uh, and so the Aisha and the Prophet would use code language with each other, denoting their love. She asked the Prophet how he would describe her love, his love for her. The Prophet ﷺ said, like a strong binding knot, the more you tug, the stronger it gets, in other words. So every so often, so now she would playfully ask, how is the knot? And the Prophet ﷺ would say, as strong as the first day you asked. So it gives you an idea of a loving banter between a husband and wife. And when we say we follow the sunnah, I often wonder which sunnah do we follow? You know? So here is the Prophet Sallam giving us the best of example. And so this also is reflected, I found this, when a man, if, if men can understand this, this is my advice to men, when a man can listen to a woman's feelings without getting angry and frustrated, he gives her a wonderful gift. He makes it safe for her to express herself. The more she's able to express herself, the more she feels heard and understood. And the more she's able to give a man, and the more she's able to give a man the loving trust, acceptance, appreciation, admiration, approval, and encouragement that he needs. And often when I've spoken to men about what was wrong in the marriage, it's like this, they said often that they stopped being the hero for the wife. The wife, they felt that the wife didn't respect them any longer, or she didn't trust his judgment, or she um, you know, was too busy, you know, preoccupied with the children or something, uh, you know, and she wasn't maybe res responding to what his needs were. These are the some of the things that men say. But on the other side, what women say, if a man truly, let's say, follows the sunnah, enables the woman, and then what you draw from each other is very powerful, if we're able to actually do that. But it's challenging, it's not, it's not easy. So what I want to look at, a little bit from the Quran, I'll try to wind up soon, is that in this, this is the month of Ramadan, this is the month of the Quran. And I just took a quick look at the names of the Quran in the Quran. And there are many names which gives us a little bit of an idea that the Quran is maybe encouraging us in some things. It's a criteria, you know, of Furqan. It's a criteria of judgment, right? It's a shifa, a healing, it's a cure. It's wisdom, it's full of wisdom, it's perfect wisdom, it's guidance, eye-opening evidences, the book that gives life to faith, ruh, right? Bushra, glad tidings. And we can draw, we can draw, as we draw from the 99 mills, we can draw from the, uh, what the Quran actually tells us about the Quran. It's a, what is it? This multi-dimensional book, this book which has truly everything in it. Are we doing justice to this book? Are we drawing from this book and the Sunnah? 
really the things that we need to make our lives relevant in the times that we live in. So I just want to focus on a shifa because the reality is our marriages, as far as I said earlier, our marriages are struggling. You know, and one of the biggest problems is polygamy or secret marriages. This is a big problem in, in London, right? Uh, like I said earlier, teenagers in particular are using this as an excuse to have sex basically without responsibility. And men, as I told you, in the seven cycles of life, something is happening in that midlife crisis for men. And what I personally will say, what I think it is, so I, my purpose today is not to blame people, right? And I could sit here, as often women do, blame the men for everything. But the question I have to men, what's happened? What aren't we listening to in men in this midlife crisis when they become vulnerable? Maybe to doing things outside of the marriage, uh, when they have a loving life at home, beautiful children, everything they have, they have everything. What makes them go and do something that they, you know, what is it? It's like, it's a crazy madness period of time. What's happening? And one of the things I personally would say, and you're entitled to your views and I'd be interested in them, is I think that we're not, we've burdened men culturally with things that they are struggling with and are not able to articulate. And they feel burdened with this responsibility and then they want an escape. And often these things are an escape. It's, 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 a, it's a signal to say something is wrong. So we can either, and women who find themselves in this situation, of course, it's very hurtful, it's painful, and particularly painful for children. Children really struggle. And, and, and polygamy, even straight polygamy, where the woman knows the man's gonna get off marriage. People often forget, people get hurt, and children get hurt. I did a workshop a few years ago in a community where polygamy is common. They practice it a lot. And because I knew this, I didn't actually mention polygamy at all because I, I don't want anything controversial. In the question time, the teenagers, because it was two teenagers, the first thing they said is about polygamy. Why is polygamy allowed? Because they don't agree with it. Because at children, they were suffering. And they were, the reason why they brought it up is because they were suffering. And they could see the hurt that was around. So we forget that also children get affected by these things. So therefore the question is, if we are more present in our relationships, more able to disengage from this worldly world that we've created around, sucked into the economic system. We have to make the effort. We must make the effort to not let that drown us, to constantly be in relationships with each other. And the Quran is the, the best of books. It's the book for healing. And we heal. We can heal. You know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall heal the breasts of the believers. O oh, mankind, there's come to your guidance from your Lord and a healing for the diseases in your hearts and for those who believe in guidance and mercy. And we have sent down the Quran such things that have healing and mercy for the believers. So, inshallah, people have the best of marriages here, but when there are problems and challenges, with careful consideration and negotiation and understanding what the root of the problem is, I really do believe that these things can be overcome. And we know as Muslims where they can't be overcome, we have the option of divorce. But the question I ask is, have we put enough effort in trying to resolve the problem? Let's try and do that a little bit more. So what is Islam? And this month, holy month, what are we doing? Islam, the Quran, we re, it reconnects us to our primordial, primordial values. The Quran challenges us. It's not a happy, clappy, sitting, everything is lovely. It challenges us in our core nature, encourages us to do more. We get empowered to say, okay, this is good in my life. This is difficult. I need to do something to change that. And whatever lessons we've learned in life, we reintegrate them into our life. So there's this constant cycle of change and renewal, shifa, healing. You know, this is this is the organic nature of Islam, the organic nature of the Quran and Sunnah. That it 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 is a pro-life. Where possible, it's about healing. So just to con conclude, really. 
good communication, listen to each other, give each other time and space, respect each other's strengths. You know, sometimes, like, if a woman, for example, is really good at organizing her house, it's nice if the husband says, yeah, you're really good at that. I really have benefited something from learning from you. Or the man is really good at, um, you know, being good with the children, because men often are very good with the children. The, the woman should recognize that and say, yeah, yeah, I really enjoyed what you did with the children today. And sometimes those words stick in our throat here and we can't say it. We should be able to say it. Support each other during weak periods of weakness. If we're not already engaged and aware of each other, we won't even notice that there's a period of weakness. We should try and be aware of that. Have social life together. Enjoy yourself. You know, um, try and have time without the children. Right? Do things by yourselves. Uh, and, and appreciate what each other enjoys. Like, for example, I'm not into football, but Fab likes football, so I watch it with him. Right? So you do what the other person likes. Uh, and don't let the children separate your lives. So, so Norma said, no amount of guilt can change the past, and no amount of worrying can change the future. Go easy on yourself, for the outcome of all affairs is determined by God's decree. If something is meant to go elsewhere, it will never come your way. But if it is yours by destiny from you, it cannot flee, uh, flee you, basically. So, you know, there's something really deep and meaningful in that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Romero, uh, for confusing us even more. Because, uh, and there's evidence I'm going to ask the audience to share some comments at this stage. I like particularly challenging the ones. Any comment, any remarks, any question? So anyone wants to share any comments about what was spoken about? You can raise your hand. I have a microphone. I'm blessed that I'm here listening to you. Um, but yeah, most, most my question is actually uh, my question is actually uh, with what you uh, uh, said with regards to uh, uh, the advent of uh, social media technology before there wasn't even any phones, there wasn't even any phones, not even any phones, but right now not even phones, you can do all sort of uh, things with your phone, uh, especially sharing photos for what do you think as a husband um, if your spouse shares photos um, on social media uh, thank you that's a really um, important question and uh, very relevant according to Marsden and Adley, this is a dating agency in America, where 84% of divorces taking place in America now is got to do something with uh, what they call online infidelity. The new media has opened up a new evil world. I think the Muslims need more than anything at the moment need many things. We talk about fiqh al-kaliyat, the fiqh of minority, for those of us living in the West. But I think more important than anything, we need to develop a fiqh of the internet. Because this is the one area that is growing fast, it is now dominating our life. In Saudi Arabia, a few years ago, it was a big, big debate. Because the way we organize our life is about segregation of the sexes, the male and the female. You know, when you go in the houses, the women are on one side, the men in the other side. Then the inner sanctum is for the family. But social media has no respect for that. 
So you could have your son or daughter sitting next to you, chatting with his boyfriend or girlfriend very inappropriately, and you are right in the middle of the inner symptoms of your house. The boundaries are cro crossed. So what do you do as a Muslim? There's also another thing uh, about it. The social media gives the illusion of secrecy. Those of you, and I learned that uh, at a later point, there is nothing that you send out as a message on Facebook, on WhatsApp, on Viber, on um, whatever format. It can never be deleted. It becomes part of storage somewhere or something like that. But most people delude themselves because when they are sitting, you are depressed or you are alone. You forget the hadith where he says, there's no people, two people, men and a woman, who are not mahrim, but the third is shaitan. So it's very easy to get excited by the media and start exchanging, you know, lucid kind of things. And you think that it is a... The Western world has actually come up with a set of uh, indications by such dating agencies of what is wrong. And the main principle, again, like the Islamic one, Anything that you are sharing with somebody who is, if you are a husband, who is sharing with somebody who is not your wife, or your wife sharing something not your husband, on which you cannot share in public, or you cannot share together, then that something is wrong. It's morally wrong. It's in principle against the institution of, uh, you know, loyalty and partnership. So it's very, very important that the medium now is brought in a new complication in relationship. It is also brought, of course, the irony about technology, it always can be a force for good or a force for... It's also a way when uh, you can raise expectations. Like your bloody wife wants you to send a message all the time. I love you, I'm missing you, I'm doing this. I'm you are busy driving, you want to have an accident because you want to tell her you love her. So there's also to have to balance some kind of uh, balance and things like that. So I think that in everything else we need to consider that one of the things about the social media is not only about relation, but it is one killer of communications. People every day talk to hundreds of friends. You know, before when I was grown up, the worst punishment I could be given was I was told, go up to your room and, or in the corner and sit alone. Now my son wants me to tell him to go to the room because there he's got his Twitter, he's got his this, he's got his own, you know, he's actually enjoying it. They watch, I don't know how they do it. They can watch TV, be on WhatsApp, uh, watch YouTube, listen to the music and do hundred things at one time. You see, and this is the contradiction about the time. But when you ask them to do, you say, well, I can only do one thing at a time. Same thing when it comes to education. Our young people today, I like football. You tell them, what's the first 11 of Barcelona? They will give you all the 11 names. Of Madrid, they will tell you. Manchester United, they will tell you. But tell them, Give me the name of the Ashram of Bashar, you know, the 10 people who have been promised heaven. And oh, it's so difficult. I can't understand. I can't memorize all those complicated names. So these are the way that we are fighting for the tiny kind of uh, uh, space. So technology is a thing. And like I said, one of the issues I find, and this is just to supplement uh, Omera's presentation, yeah, I think one of the big things we need to do is to create a balance in our expectation of what we can get out of marriage. I think each generation has to come up with a formula of what you want out of a marriage. I think before, 
even when the uh, pioneers went to America or Australia to find new lands and things, it was basically a relationship that was based on convenience and utility. So the man will be out in the farm looking after the cattle and the thing, the woman will be running the household together, they're struggling economically and stuff. I think now, nowadays, it's a different kind of uh, thing. Perhaps not many, but one income can run a house. But nowadays, to really have a reasonable uh, lifestyle, you need to income. And normally, the woman is also equally educated, or if not more, and the man. Also, you go to work not only to earn money, but to get your own self-fulfillment and satisfaction. So we have to negotiate in the, in, the, in the marriage, the expectation. You are not getting ready to find uh, somebody to provide the bacon or the thing only. You're not finding security. But people want their husband, and I'm talking now from a male perspective, their husband to be not only their friend, not only their protector, but also their sheikh, also their, you know, father figure, also, and sometimes it can be overwhelming for men because the men themselves are not product of, product of um, a perfect uh, outcome. So everybody has to struggle, and out of this struggling, some people can't maintain the struggle. So either it takes time before the reality creeps in, or it comes on earlier on. We may have talked about, there is a film called The Seven Year Each, which talk about after seven years in the 50s, marriage started to break down. Saudi Arabia, you said three years old, but I'm told in Malaysia it's five years. I don't know why. But the whole idea is so long as you understand what you are heading into, and people should be making it clear, and this is through parents, through discussion, openly, you see, like it was pointed, we prepare so much for the wedding, but do very little preparation for marriage. Let's change that around, the money, the emotional effect that we do for the wedding. Let's balance it out and also present for the marriage. The marriage is when all the guests have had their food and criticize it because however you do it, they always say it's a bit too salty, too much oil or too much something, you know. And let's focus on the marriage and let's give our young people real expectations and real goals about what they can achieve out of the thing. Thank you. Sorry, which one? So I'll just add to that. I think, like what I was trying to say, is that if you have started off uh, that you're marrying somebody out of your choice, both of you, and you wanted to be in that marriage, let's say we're talking about that kind of a marriage. If something goes wrong down the line, then you have to ask questions. What? Why is one or the other? behaving in a way which is completely inappropriate. So therefore, I don't think by definition people are bad, but you have to say, or doing things deliberately even, necessarily. But what is happening along the line? Where, where's the lack of communication? Where's all the things that are failing down the line that somebody feels the need to do that? It doesn't make it right. It doesn't justify what anybody does. Uh, but I think we need to understand. But there's two things to that. One is building your own resilience, what we should have as Muslims, we, we, we work on the assumption that our faith gives us resilience. It, it supports us against temptation, that we, by definition, shouldn't be um, behaving inappropriately. That's what we think as Muslims. So we need to build, build the resilience. But we are human beings, and sometimes things don't go right. Therefore, when things go wrong, we have to say, let's find out why they're going wrong. And I agree with Fraud, the whole thing about online, uh, it's, it's, it's a whole new genre now, and it's complicated, and we have to really work hard, I think, against protecting ourselves against the abuse of it, really, basically.
Assalamu alaikum. Um, I have a question about your seven cycles. Um, you talked about the section where men um, at a later stage in life, they go through a certain, um, or they could go through a midlife crisis of some sort. And you talked about culture and how they have to carry certain things which affect this and it could spur this happening. Um, my question has to do with the culture bit. Um, I, I'm sure, as everyone can attest to, a lot of us uh, attach ourselves to our culture. We're proud of it and we um, envelop ourselves with it. So we find protection in it to some extent. Um, and when these things happen, how would you help a man um, go through this crisis without isolating him or the both of you from your culture? And how, what should you expect of your culture to help you achieve this as well? I think sadly often, however beautiful our cultures are, and they are, we have developed these, some of these bad habits of being judgmental, of talking about each other, of about being, uh, you know, chastising. So therefore, people fear social isolation if they are confronted by something or if they're honest about something. So for example, if uh, let's say a man uh, has a midlife crisis and has, um, does a mistake in a relationship with somebody, how, if the woman is the one who's suffering in such a situation, but it's so easy for people in our cultures to blame the woman. The woman is to blame. Was she not giving the man enough attention, you know? Uh, or the man, what's wrong with him that he's doing? You know, we, we blame and we gossip and we talk. We have to stop doing that because our objective as Muslims should be, okay, you know, we know this couple, they, we know they have a good track record, we know they, you know, that everything is good. How can we help that couple? How can we stop the gossip about them? How can we listen to what the issues are and bring together people who can help them negotiate? Or even if other people aren't involved, how do we help them individually to negotiate their healing and their relationship? So that's what I think that... Uh, and then uh, our culture should be more forgiving. They're a little less forgiving these days. You know, if somebody does something wrong, that's it. They're doomed forever in our eyes. Allah is more forgiving than we are ourselves. So this is the elements of our cultures I think that we have to revise a little bit. Of course, if somebody is consistently perpetrating, is being harsh, is being cruel, then of course that person, whether the man or woman, needs to be made accountable for whatever they're doing wrong. All right? So, you know. I think it's a... It's a difficult um, one. I want to say something, but I'm worried because there's a man here called Muslim Kilby. He might come and smack me on the head. He will not like what I'm saying. But to be serious, it's a serious issue for men because we have glorified, for instance, polygamy to make it more than what it is and nobody who's been in second world will tell you that he's actually getting done with the headache and people who've got two or three wives they walk around with a strut within the Muslim community and all the male jokes are about getting second wife and things like that and this is contrary to the teaching of Islam when we are allowed to marry second wife, the conditions, I remember a very, you know him, Ali Omar bin Hafiz, when he traveled to America, and a professor from a university in California asked him, how do you justify polygamy in Islam? He didn't know that Ali Omar himself had a polygamous marriage. And Ali Omar said, may Allah bless him, that this is a very difficult question, and I don't want to sound a hypocrite. I am in a polygamous marriage. It is something that happens, but it is very difficult, and it is not really for everybody and recommended, because you are putting an extra skill in your life, that of being just. 
it can eat away all your other goods of goodwill by putting yourself in that situation. So there is one thing, is that unless men show a bit more criticism of polygamous arrangement instead of glorifying it, that's part of the culture of paradigm that has to change. But the worst situation, and I'm telling you personally as a man, is the problem is the women. I know Omer must probably disagree, and some of you, but there is a lot of women. I don't know, they got tired of looking for men to get married, they can't find somebody, but they poach on other people's husbands. It is definitely true in the UK. So most of the time, is they come, they look, and again, they tell me, the idea is, when you are a tested man, you know, you already, we know you're a good husband, you're good that, so I take a risk with some idiot in media, you know, so I'd rather be second wife to a good husband than first wife to a bad person. This is a reality, and also the challenge is also, is one of the biggest problems facing our young people is about how, not when, but how to get married, and to whom, they are finding it very difficult. It's not like before, from the same kampong, you'll find people, or it used to be a generation later, you went to universities and found somebody. Nowadays, it's much more difficult to, this, we know so many single people, men and female, but somehow they just never seem to be the right kind of mixture. So all these are real challenges. And in Islam, we don't ask Allah to take away the challenges, but we ask Allah to make the challenges bearable. And one of the ways we do it is to create institutions in which one, the expectations of marriage are made realistic this as a society. Secondly, we make sure that there is an involvement at a certain level. People want to get married. That you can see, some, you know, when somebody is in love, they go crazy, they don't know what they have to. Uh, when I went uh, to tell my mother that I wanted to get married in London, she asked me which woman, and I said in London. I knew that she was very disappointed because she never met this girl. She always thought I'd marry somebody that she knew that my wife was going to be, as I'm the eldest, look after my family. But what she did is she said, she gave a sigh. She said, oh, alhamdulillah, it's your responsibility. You see, and true to God, it's been my responsibility, I tell you, 27 years to keep, but it has also been responsibility of everybody. Like we said, in the Sunnah of Islam, people forget. When you're invited for a wedding, you don't only attend the wedding. You know, when you attend a nikah, you're supposed to be a witness for that wedding. You're supposed to ask about that couple throughout their existence. And if there's a problem, you're supposed to be there for them. But we just go there to eat the nasi goreng, whatever, and then go away. So all these institutions which need to be revived, need to be revived. And the other thing is, like I said, so much emphasis, particularly now when the economy is uh, difficult, spend thousands and thousands of ringgit on wedding, but nothing for marriage, nothing to compact to make the, I don't know what, most of I have children, I'll end up in the same uh, uh, story. But amongst men, this is the reality that uh, the culture the sister is talking about is difficult, but we do. I will lie if I don't tell you. I do admire those people who've got one, more than one wife. But I'm afraid of my wife. I'm not going to get married to second one. That's one. And then the second thing is, unless women show respect for each other and keep off other people's husband, I don't know, I can't tell them what to do, but that is going to continue. In London, I know, they literally, and I'm not exaggerating it, throw themselves at men to be married. Second wife. First they say marry and be second wife. Once they're married, then they put pressure to divorce the first wife. And this is because we have very high rate of divorce, most probably higher than the mainstream. So, Allah protects us.
got time for two more questions, and there's a gentleman here, and I've got a list of our, uh, questions which I'll pick one from. Um, my, um, my, it's not so much a question as it is a comment um, toward this notion about social media and the need to have a new level of understanding about uh, how to deal with the social media. I think we just need to kind of change our relationships and understanding as to what, what these smartphones are that we carry around with us and it's really all our friends and family so when you think you're alone you're really not you're just you're hiding them all inside of this so um, it's a matter of um, understanding kind of the nature of relationship because it's tearing us away from maybe the primary relationship that we would otherwise have you know you see your kids and families being together in a, in, in a restaurant they're not together they're, they're with all their friends and they brought their friends secretly in their pocket and we need to understand that it's, it's not what it appears it's not just a box, it's the elements of what a relationship should be. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I mean, we're not going to get rid of smartphones tomorrow. They're part of our lives now. We have to accept it. So we have to find a new other on how to, to live with these phones uh, and not let them control us. But... As you say, what is more important is to build our primary relationships. It's like even what they say about using computers for schools, like maths and all that. They say, how can you learn to do your basic education with a computer before you know the primary things? So with everything in life, you have to know what's the primary uh, important things in life before you then engage in the secondary things in life, basically. So I agree with you on that. Um, and of course, as you say, there are some benefits in keeping connected with people across the world through WhatsApp, for example. So, <laughs> you know, as I am doing. Um, I believe in China has got special uh, rehabilitation center for those people who are addicted to social media. I'm saying this honest. I have an almost perfect wife, but I like to send her to a rehabilitation center like that. Because she's always on the Facebook, no time work for that. And there should be rules and laws about it that when people are sitting down. Now you're going to see a real life domestic. I'm going to say that he's more on social media than I am. So this is our very argument. <laughs> Okay, so we have a few questions, those last sort of questions. Uh, they're very broad, different questions. I, I'm not sure which one to pick. Uh, what do you do when you have doubts about your decisions and emotions? Are there specific du'as and prayers? I mean, this, the, the quick answer to that is to do istikhara, right? When you're not sure. But what I was told about istikhara is to really get the benefit of it is you have to truly let go of your prejudgment. We often go into istikhara saying, I'm letting go, but really I want this answer to it. So you truly have to be in a state where you can find what message comes to you. So istikhara, I would say, is one of them. And I was told in times of confusion and, uh, and unease is to say, Ya Latif, just to keep reciting it. I think 129 times in particular. Just, just keep saying Ya Latif because to give ease and to find succor. But there's many du'as you can say. But I think the other question to when you have doubts is, yes, you can draw on the du'as, but the du'as tell us something. We should be uh, like Allah. Sometimes we think, I think there's a hadith about um, that uh, Allah listens to all our prayers, but do we hear his answer? Right? I think there's a the one like that, uh, hadith. So therefore, are we listening to the answer of our supplications? And sometimes what the answer is is not what we want. And I know, for example, particularly when sometimes we're at the point of maybe making a bad decision, but we're not aware that it's a bad decision. 
We don't want to listen to the answer which is telling us step back from that situation. I don't know how many women in particular I know who have a relationship or want to marry a man who is completely inappropriate from every point of view, but he's given her some attention. He's told her, oh, I love you, you're this and that. But he's completely inappropriate. She's not listening. And however many days she says that she, she, she has to be aware uh, and challenge herself to say this person is not right for you, right? So we can do the du'as, uh, but on these difficult decisions on who's the right person for us, something like that, it's, it's a hard decision. That's why you have people around you to give you good counsel, basically. Um, and I just quickly, it'd be cheeky and, and do the other one. It says, uh, to accept apology based on your own time or pretending to be okay to please others around family. And I am taking that to mean several things. It could mean that you are being persuaded to marry somebody from your family, you don't really want to, you feel you have to, or you're in a relationship, you're in a marriage, and everybody, you're, you're justifiably upset about something, and everybody's telling you, have supper, be patient, this, that, the other, and you just accept the, you just accept the situation and, uh, when you're not really feeling it in your heart. That's a tough one. And that's one of the things in everything in life. I think that um, it goes back to the more you know yourself, the more you know your Lord. Everything goes back to that, if you know yourself. If you're in a situation where you're finding it difficult to find the words to explain that that other person is hurting you, or that other person is making a wrong decision for you, you have to find a way and dig deep. Because what's the consequence? Some people go along with these wrong decisions because they're afraid. But I'm looking at you, but I don't think you've answered it. But um, what's the consequences of not being brave at such a time? You marry somebody you really don't want to marry because your parents suggest it. You go in, you don't really love that person. Maybe there was somebody else you wanted to marry who you know, you'd be better with. There's an injustice. You're unjust to yourself, then you get married to somebody else, you become unjust to them. You have children, and you're not really engaged with the children because there's no marriage based on love. So it's injustice upon injustice upon injustice. So isn't it better to be a bit brave in the beginning and say, you know, this is not going to work for me if it's a marriage because you're protecting everybody from things that could go wrong in the future, right? And the other side in marriage is that even then, find people you can trust around you to help with counsel. If, I know often it's not easy to do that because we don't tend to do that in Muslim cultures. We, we don't negotiate. We, we're not honest with these things. But try to find somebody who you trust, who you can share something with, who can then maybe go and give some counsel to the other person and negotiate your point of view for them. Because sometimes it's not easy to express what you feel. And this is the same for men as well, because men can't express their feelings always either, and sometimes need a medium, a mediator to come in. So I, I remember, I just find my finish with this example, we were negotiating, uh, we're helping a couple get married. There were two young Pakistanis actually from different villages, different regions, sorry, in Pakistan. And both sides of the family were dead against it, right? Uh, and they were wanting advice on, you know, that they, they were planning to get married, they would do it by themselves and go against their families. And they were marrying all for the right reasons actually, because they were religiously conscious, they met through religion, but the families were a little bit more cultural. So I spoke to uh, Dr. Sheikh Dash, who was uh, our big imam there, and asked him what should, should I suggest in such a thing. And he, because these were Hanafis basically, so he said there's different rulings according to Madhab, but in the Hanafi Madhab, you have to exhaust every possibility of trying to bring the parents round before legitimately the children can go off and get married. So you have to exhaust those options first. But the two couples were really scared to do that. They were really scared to start that process. So we managed to persuade them. They thought of somebody that they knew who they could speak to them. After a lot of negotiating, they managed to find somebody who could speak to the parents. And it wasn't easy. And the parents, was, they went ahead with the wedding. The parents sort of said, okay, but they weren't going to come.
mum. But in the end, eventually, through negotiation, the parents came, and alhamdulillah, they resolved it all. So it takes time, it takes patience, it takes using a little bit of wisdom to say, have I used up all the options that I have in order to resolve this situation? So that's what I mean. I think we've come to the end. I hope you learned something. And what is very important is for the morning, is I was supposed to be the speaker, but I allowed my wife to speak most of the time. That makes her very happy, makes her feel important, and I lose nothing. So, but still, I did not share my message with you. I'll tell you, being a husband and being a man is a very lonely process. We men, we talk about everything except our emotions. There are very few people in the world that one has a relationship can talk about very intimate things. This is not only to do with Muslims, but with all men in general. We are afraid, part of it, our egos are very big. So DNA, we don't like to talk about our personal things. But my final advice, what made me not mad and still married 27 years is the four widows, I call them. Listen, please, very careful. Don't ever forget the birthday. Don't forget the anniversary. Don't forget Valentine's Day. And four, always say your mother-in-law's cooking is the best in the world. But the fifth hidden pillar of a successful marriage is change your credit pin number every two weeks. Thank you very much. This is a conversation, we continue, we can talk after this. We'll have our email if anybody wants something private to talk about. I'm prepared to sit down much better on the side when the women are not listening. I can give men some real advice, you know? And uh, it's, not, it's not for nothing that I work with a stick. You don't have to use it, but just having one matters a lot. Again, thank you very much uh, to the center. Thanks very much to uh, Sister Shaila for having the confidence to give us the platform and for the generosity that has been extended to us in this country. Lovely uh, country, we love it. Our children love it. By the way, my daughter is here. And let me make clear, what we are discussing is not for you. I'm going to decide who's your husband. I'm going to choose him. I'm going to interview the brother. You know, and at least I need three days minimum to talk to him. So, again, uh, thank you and Ramadan Mubarak. May Allah, during this holy month, accept our fasting and our prayers. And uh, may he continue to uh, bless this center to be a great place for sharing, learning, and for inspiring uh, people. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار رب جعلنا مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربان صغيرا سبحان ربك عزتي يا ما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله على الله مصدر سلم على سلم